so I would like just to introduce our keynote, keynote speaker uh, of today, uh, Dr. Laura Bessler. Um, uh, Laura Bessler uh, coordinates strategic initiatives, faculty programming, communication, and online presence as a program specialist three for the Center of, for Excellence and Learning and Teaching at Iowa State University. Laura serves as the deputy title nine coordinator for the Office of Equal Opportunity and is a member of the NSCORE I-SCORE, which is the National and Iowa State Conference on Race and Ethnicity Project, and the uh, Equal Opportunity Council and the Iowa State University's Diversity, Equity, Equity and Inclusion Councils. Thank you, Laura, for um, uh, participating in this hot topic session and uh, now uh, you're welcome to, to share your screen and start your, your, your talk. Thank you so very much. I am honored to be a part of this amazing conference. Um, I, I, it, when Nuria asked me to participate, I was like, oh, what an honor. And I sat in on a few of the presentations yesterday and learn things that I didn't know. <laughs> um, it uh, Obviously, what you all are experts in is not what I'm an expert in, but I was fascinated by it. And I sat in and listened and learned about biofuels and silica and uh, insects and all kinds of things early yesterday morning. So thank you so much. So as my dear friend, Nuria, uh, introduce me. I work for the Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching. I've been a part of Iowa State since 1997, which seems like forever ago. Um, but I've worked for the Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching for almost 10 years now, which is a whole decade. I can't believe it. And uh, this last spring, let me go back to the beginning slide. Uh, this last spring, as you all know, we had to do the quick pivot to teaching online. And one of the many charges that we had as a center is to help our faculty to understand the best practices for engaging with their students. Because as we all learned very quickly, it's very different to teach online remotely uh, than it is to teach face to face, unless you've done it before, unless you're comfortable in front of a camera, unless you've interacted with students through online chat and so on. So what I am going to do for this first part of our presentation today um, is I am going to talk about um, how uh, effective and meaningful faculty and interaction, interactions and exploring those. And then we'll brainstorm a little bit kind of individually on how to maintain and inspire student engagement throughout all learning environments. Because as at Iowa State, in Ames, Iowa, we are hoping to be on, on campus face-to-face -face this fall. Um, there will definitely be those online components though. And what I hope is what we did so well uh, during this last year is that we continue to do those good things. Um, I wanted to make sure that everybody knew all of the resources that I'm talking about today are available on our website. Um, and if our moderators can put in the main chat for everyone who's participating right now, um, you can just go to that link and you will be able to access all the resources that I'm talking about. So when, when I'm discussing certain things, you're like, oh, I, I wanna learn a little bit more about that. You're welcome to go to the webpage, locate that information, and then you can go to the resources. Um, so the web page itself is the short URL here on this page, which is bit.ly slash CELT dash engage, E-N-G-A-G-E. -E. The reason why I utilize short URLs in particular during presentations is because it's much easier for me to tell you what that short URL is rather than having read an entire web address for with 5 million characters in it. The other way that you can access the page is by utilizing your smart device, uh, opening up the camera, pointing it towards this QR code, and it will uh, open up a, uh, 
URL for you to click on and then open it up on your smart device. And I'll just take a moment so that if you wanted to have it open while you are participating, then you can. So what I want to start this out with is the importance of belonging. When students feel that they belong to a community, they trust their teachers, their peers, they're more motivated and engaged. They have fewer behavioral struggles. They respond more adaptively to critical feedback. And ultimately, they have higher academic performance and overall well being. You, as an instructor, can play an important role in helping students feel that they belong. And one way you can do that is by cultivating engagement with you yourself as the instructor their peers and ultimately with the course content. So first off, we're gonna talk about engagement with the instructor. <clears throat> when you look at the page that I shared, uh, the self dash engage page, what, you'll, what you will see is a very long list of many things that uh, instructors can do to help uh, promote engagement with their students. I wanna make sure that I share the keywords in this word cloud. So these are the words that came up the most. You can utilize this easy word cloud, put a bunch of words in it, and it'll show you what is showing up the most. Um, and it's wordart.com. Um, easy thing, it's free, feel free to use it. Um, but the key things were feedback, presence, asking and asking goes to asking students for feedback, and also having them give quick feedback with things, time, taking the time to get to know our students, um, soliciting, sharing, interacting, and so on. So let's go in a little bit with that. The first thing that you are going to want to do as an instructor when you're promoting engagement, which ultimately helps students to belong on your campus, which is essential. Let's think about retention right now, right? Defining your online presence, how do you come across as that empathetic person to form connections and respond to students throughout your course? Now think about what do you want to share with your students so that they get to know you a little bit more. One way that you can do it is to provide an introductory video. Here you can see me just being kind of me um, and doing the same hand motions that I do. Um, but having an introductory video in your uh, campus's learning management system, and for us at Iowa State, that is Canvas, we utilize a tool in Canvas called Studio, and you can do a quick video. It doesn't have to be professional. I mean, it's nice if it was, but it doesn't have to be. What you're gonna do there is just share a little bit about yourself, share about the course, talk about how the course is gonna connect your students to what they're gonna do after they graduate or what they're doing right now in other classes. The other thing that you're gonna do is just introduce yourself as a human. You're gonna personalize yourself, let students know who you are and so that you start creating that connection. A nice thing about the videos that you utilize is captioning, making sure that you activate the captions within each one of those videos. And that helps people like myself who prefer having captions because it helps me focus on what someone is saying. It also is a great tool for those students who may have English as a second language in the United States or here at Iowa State, English is the primary language used for teaching. Um, but what you need to know is those captions play such a critical uh, part of a student's learning. So making sure that you activate those. In the Canvas course or in your learning management system, you're gonna to wanna to have an instructor page and introduce yourself and having and sharing photos and consider showing the students what hobbies you have, um, if you travel, perhaps you have pets. So in our house, we have two Dobermans and two cats and I have a human as well. But sharing information like that so students can feel connection. Perhaps they have a dog at home or a cat. Um, maybe they travel. Um, and sharing your research interests because maybe a student is like, oh, I've always wanted to learn more about that. And perhaps they'll come to you and see if they can be a part of your undergraduate research team. 
Also, sharing your departmental profile page. So take a moment and think about what would you share with, to connect with your students. Another thing that you're going to want to do is having you be a part of the course. So sharing video updates throughout the course each maybe the day before each time that you're going to meet synchronously with your students or perhaps even before class for a face to face class. Just doing a short video. This is what we're going to cover today. These are the things we're going to make sure that we talk about and these are the benefits to you participating. Maintaining an active daily presence. A course should not seem that it's running on autopilot, right? Um, one of the things that I appreciate with our conference that we're participating in this week is each day we're getting a daily briefing. This is what's happening today. These are the hot topics in the forum. Um, these are the things that you can participate in. It's a way to connect with each other, even though we're not physically with each other. So having and maintaining that active daily presence is essential. Another thing is soliciting immediate formative feedback in real time. So if we were all able to participate in Zoom together, um, I know if you're participating or attending, you are in the conference um, interface, but in Zoom, we have ways to solicit immediate formative feedback, getting the pulse of where the students are, how they're doing and how they're feeling. So you can do that with chat. You can utilize the reaction bar, um, which emoticon, so hands applauding or a thumbs up, um, a heart, laughing or joy, <gasps> shock, or even uh, celebration, right? The other thing you can have students do is to raise their hands. One of the things that I do want to point out, and you can Google this, is if you want to utilize a different uh, skin color for the hands clapping and the thumbs up, you actually can go into the Zoom interface and change the color of the skin, which I find to be kind of a nice little um, added benefit in Zoom. The final thing that you can do to do kind of that quick pulse, right, uh, in web conferencing is to utilize polls. You can set up the polls to ask quick questions about the content or if you just want to see how they're doing or what is the greatest challenge that they're facing. It's anonymous, which is helpful, um, but it's also a way for you to gauge where the students are and how they're doing. Asking formative feedback from your students. Now, this is something that we promote a lot at the Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching, in particular when we went online last spring to find out how our students are doing and what actions or whatever you're doing in that online course environment. Is it helping your students? Are they engaging with the information and so on? So there are two different tools that we promote quite a bit through the center. Um, the first tool is something that you can utilize for ongoing student feedback. And it's called the Critical Incident Questionnaire. It's by Stephen Brookfield, who's based out of uh, McAllister College, uh, St. Thomas, Un University of St. Thomas uh, in Minnesota. And that critical incident questionnaire asks five questions and they're all open-ended. So when did you feel most engaged? When were you most distanced? What was most affirming or helpful for you? And what was puzzling or confusing? And then what surprised you most? Now you do this in a qualitative format. Um, in Canvas, we actually have it set up that you can import it directly from the Canvas Commons if you're a Canvas user. And uh, you um, publish it within your course. You send it out to the students, you get the feedback, you take a look at it and you see what are some of the themes within the uh, content that you responses that you receive back from the students. So when did they feel most engaged? When what was the most distancing thing from the, the for them this week? You can send this weekly or bi-weekly, particularly if you're just starting something new. Like for example, you start doing group work or you uh, decide to add 
X, Y, Z to your course, but asking the students what those things are, seeing what themes you discover, finding out those three themes or four themes, and then sharing back with the students what you learned, what you may change, what you won't change. And then on top of it, the students, what they learn from you is that you're listening to them. You're hearing from them what's working well. You're going to help promote that and encourage it more. And you're hearing from them what isn't working well. We also have something called the plus delta tool and the web the short url there is where you can go to it and learn a little bit more download the information and what have you i just want to make sure everything on this uh, presentation is is available for you so the plus and the delta this particular mid-semester uh feedback tool formative feedback tool is great because it really engages the students in the importance of their learning so what is helping me to learn in this course what changes are needed in this course to improve that learning what am i doing to learn in this class and what do i need to do to improve my learning in this class now when you think about that and again you do that take a look at the themes you share back with the students those three or four themes. What's important is particularly what's helping me to learn in this course, right? And what am I doing to learn in this course? Because what can help those students that may not be uh, succeeding as best as they can is they're going to learn from the other students what's working well with them. And maybe they change the way in which they're learning and growing in your course. The next piece is providing students with interactive feedback. In Canvas, the learning management system, there's a number of different ways that students can receive feedback from an instructor. There is a tool within Canvas, and I'm sure other learning management systems have it as well, but you can provide audio or video feedback to your students rather than typing out all kinds of information or writing out information. You can just say, I noticed that you did this. You may want to consider this. And you can do it as an audio or video. You can do screencast feedback. So you can show them what they turned in for their work and be able to point out, you know, you might want to consider updating this information or when you look at this diagram and so on. The other things are uh, utilizing the speed grader or a rubric. A rubric is a fantastic way for students to know what they need to do to be successful in your course. And you can incorporate that in Canvas, in Blackboard, and I'm sure every learning management system has something similar. Hosting virtual student office hours. One of the things that we learned over the last couple of years is helping change the framework when it comes to office hours. So back when I was an undergraduate student um, many years ago, uh, I would see office hours and think that meant I couldn't go and talk to the instructor or the professor because they're busy during that time and didn't have time to talk to me. I'm just being honest with you. Uh, I was a first generation student. I paid for school on my own. Um, I didn't want to disrupt the people that I uh, admired and respected and all those things because I thought that was the time that was centered around their work, their research, right? What I can share with you is um, as we have started to promote utilizing the term student hours on campus, we have had more people uh, share with us that students are showing up to those office hours, to those student hours. So just changing the language so students understand that that hour is for them is essential. And then making sure that you share the benefits of interacting with you during that time, promoting uh, this with the students that they could talk to you about uh, what they're interested in, is within that research that they have questions. I mean, I loved office hours when I was in statistics for my PhD. I think I went to office or student hours every time that they were open because it was difficult for me to do well in statistics. And just helping students understand the importance of that. 
but making sure that you share why student hours are important or why it was important to you when you were an undergrad. Student check-ins and privacy policies. So it within a learning management system, so your online space, you are able to see when a student is logging in and what they're interacting with within your course. And if you didn't know that you could do that, feel free to Google your LMS system and then how you can check. They call it analytics, so the learning analytics. So you can do that, you'll be able to see um, when a student has interacted, if they did homework, so on and so forth, but also recognize the privacy policy. So if you're going to follow up with a student, know what privacy policies exist within the country that you're working in, right? So for the United States, we have the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, and there are um, certain bits of information that we can share about our students and what we can't share about our students. Grades are a fine example of something that we're not able to share. Or, and it is important for you to recognize that before you do those check-ins. So at Iowa State University uh, here in Iowa, we have some pretty strict protocols when it comes to security and privacy with software. So one thing that we needed to promote last year is that faculty should not send information about grades through Outlook. Outlook did not meet Iowa State's, now make sure I point that out, Iowa State's privacy, security, so on, when it comes to sharing sensitive info. So we had to make sure that our faculty knew these are the software. So at Iowa State, it's Canvas, WebEx, Cybox, Google Drive, so on in phone calls, but not through um, Outlook, so our email. Um, but that just so you're aware that there are certain criteria that you're going to want to know about before you start engaging with your students in a check-in, right? The other thing that you might want to know is when a student is attending your course um, synchronous meetings, you might want to make sure that if you start being concerned about a student, <clears throat> excuse me, you may want to make sure that you know what resources are available on your campus. So for Iowa State University, we have an online learner support page. Just getting to know what resources are available is important because if you do reach out to a student and they say, you know, I'm having uh, issues with X, Y, and Z, or I'm having some food security issues because that is something that many campuses here in the United States, and I'm sure elsewhere, are having to cope with is that students aren't able to afford buying food because they're paying for rent, they're paying for their tuition and so on. So if a student says, you know, I'm, I just haven't been eating well, and so on. What we have on our campus is we have something called shop where students are able to go and pick up food. It's free, it's a free thing. Um, but just the fact that knowing and having that knowledge helps you to help your students. The final thing I want to make sure I talk about when you do student check-ins is making sure that you know and work with your local student affairs or services staff, the support staff, they're the experts when it comes to students. I worked in student affairs for 10 years, actually 15 years, right? What I can tell you is they're experts about our students and, and the resources that are available to them. Every campus, I'm sure, has someone who serves in that capacity. You don't need to know everything. If you're concerned about a student, reach out to that group of people and have them know about the student that you're interacting with that may have that food insecurity or um, just knowing that information is important. So I'm going to take a breath. Are there any questions right now? And then I'll move on to our engaging with other students. We're leaving all the questions to the panel discussion, Laura. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so engaging with other students. One of the ways that you can do that is starting with an online icebreaker. 
Within a learning management system, there's a discussion board. And so you can come up with a number of different icebreakers. If you have a large class, say you have over 300 students, 400, 600 students, you can have multiple icebreakers for students to choose from. That's a, that's a just an easy thing for you to do so that students can help create those connections with each other and with you. And the reason why I say with you is when you have those icebreakers so that your students can connect, make sure that you also participate. Now, I know that's something that some people may not be comfortable with. So think about the questions that you ask your students for an icebreaker. So for example, you can easily do a six word memoir. So for me, I did Laura purposefully encourages our best lives. And then below that, I explain why I chose that as my six word memoir. If you do a quick Google check, um, you would be able to see what is the six word memoir. And there's an amazing amount of information there. The page that I have linked here actually has a ton of icebreakers that you can utilize. Having the students use and explore the learning management systems profile. So every um, learning management system has a profile page for you as the individual user. And so what I encourage our faculty to do is to update their profile, make sure they have a picture, they could have a favorite quote, and then have students explore each other's profiles and choose two peers whose favorite quotes resonated with you and why as one of the icebergs. The other thing that I highly encourage everyone to do is just to take a few moments and add a profile picture to your web conferencing or video conferencing software. Now, if you Google um, how to add a profile picture to Zoom, you'll find out how you can do it. The reason why I share this is because as we have engaged with our students, we know that people have said they have Zoom fatigue. They're spending far too much time in front of a camera and not and having to be engaged in a space, right? In that video conferencing space. What I can share with you is on the left side of your screen, you're gonna see what it looks like when you are teaching and none of the students have their cameras on, right? You could require students to have their cameras on, Feel free to research some of the challenges and the social justice issues when it comes to that. Or you can make sure that you have a profile picture. So the example on the right side, you can see that I have my profile picture. Um, my camera is off, but at least it feels like I'm talking to someone, right? So that's just a little hint, and it's an easy thing to do. WebEx, MS Teams, and Zoom. The next thing is building reflective discussions. So students can interact with each other with the reflective discussions, but make sure if you decide to have this piece within your discussion board that you ask questions that you care about and that you truly are interested in. Don't just ask it to just have a discussion board. Make sure it's something that you're interested in. Setting up help teams, um, we have had a number of faculty do that. They call them triads or um, just having help teams. So what we have the instructors or what instructors do is they have a group of four students. They ask three students and then they ask you what that question is. So if, you know, I can't find information about whatever that is, right? Normally, that would just go to you because that is kind of traditionally what has occurred in particular to the faculty that I've worked with. They'll say the student always asks me, well, if they have a, a group of students that they can ask the question of, those students will work together critically to help figure out the answer to it. Now, what we hope is that they post the question and then the response on a forum within the discussion board because then students get to know um, what the question was and what the answers were. So the other thing that we want to talk about is when you do group work, make sure you plan and facilitate it thoughtfully. Make sure that you have learning objectives, that students understand the why behind it and how it's going to be helpful to them. The next the last part that I want to make sure I talk about is engagement with the course content. So make sure that when 
in, and I talked about this at the very top of this presentation, is having short audio introductions for each module. So making sure that students know what you're going to talk about, the objectives of it, how it meets or exceeds the course objectives, and then how it's going to help them after graduation. One thing that I didn't necessarily put into my slides is called transparency in learning and teaching. So TILT, T-I-L-T. Transparency in learning and teaching, what it does is talk about the purpose, the tasks, and the criteria for success, right? Look it up, T-I-L-T in higher ed. It's a great website. There's some great information there. And I'll also make sure that it is included in the resources on that CELT-Engage page. Making sure that you build activities to explore, create, edit, and more. As I sat and listened to our presentations yesterday morning, I was learning a lot of information. And I can only imagine the work that you put into discovering, uh, creating, building, and so on. Make sure that when you are uh, building activities in your course that you find ways for students to explore, create, and edit. We have a page full of instructional strategies, whether it be reading activities and having reading circles, using the jigsaw technique, and you can just Google jigsaw technique for teaching, and you'll learn tons of information on how to. Uh, when engaging with the course content, many instructors uh, have for many years said, we'll give you 5% uh, for participation, but you don't explain what participation is. So making sure that you describe specifically what participation is, what are the learning objectives for our students to participate, and then the ways in which they can participate. And there's a great resource there and an excellent article about uh, the participation. The final thing that I want to make sure I talk about is improving course accessibility for all. The challenge that we have is we moved so quickly online that we didn't take the time to make sure that the content that we were posting was accessible, that the videos that we were sharing had captioning, that any, anything that was described, so if you had a lab technique and you showed it online, did we have an audio description of what was occurring in the space? So if I am um, having to do X, Y, Z with a piece of paper and I'm showing you on the video, but I'm not describing it, I'm not saying, okay, make sure that you do this and this, and there's not captions underneath it. There's some challenges there when it comes to accessibility. Make sure that you utilize the accessibility tools within any of your software. So Microsoft, um, the, any of the Apple OS programs, there are accessibility tools within each. You want to make sure if you have a picture that you have a description for that picture. There's tons of information out there about accessibility because what we know is when the students feel that they belong to the community, that they are engaging with your course, with their content, with you as the instructor, that they are going to be more successful and they'll stay at your university. So what I talked about over the last 35 minutes is uh, how to effectively and meaningfully have those faculty and student interactions. A lot, a lot, a lot of information. Hopefully you brainstormed a few things on what you can do to help create those connections with the students, in particular with you as the instructor, and how important it is for the students to learn from you and to understand your growth and what it took for you to get to that point. All of us have had failures. All of us have had challenge that we have had to overcome in order to get to where we are today. Letting students know about that and humanizing it will only help promote our engagement and the belonging within your classroom. 
this is my information. You're welcome to email me. Um, our center, our mission is partnering with educators to advance student-centered learning. <clears throat> and then finally, I know I have four minutes before our, our panel. If there are any questions specifically for me, uh, feel free and I can just answer one or two before the official panel starts if you want, or we can move on to the panel. This is Iowa State's campus here in Ames, Iowa. To the right of your screen, the bottom right is Morrill Hall, which is where our um, building is. But I just love this picture, it's sunset. That's the west, by the way. Any questions for me before we go on the panel? I think Jen has a question. Yes, we do have a few minutes. Jen, you can ask. Very, very uh, uh, expressible uh, uh, presentation about this teaching. Yes, we uh, actually, I just had a new course this year about uh, bio separation. Wow. It's actually an uh, engineering course. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of modeling, a lot of uh, mathematics. Yes. And at the beginning, the students, uh, it seems uh, very uh, interesting, but uh, gradually they were lost interest. And uh. the numbers for, uh, like we have uh, about 40 students, then there was mm -hmm. dropping uh, like over the, over the uh, period of time of, of the teaching. Uh, yeah, I tried to, uh, you know, um, uh, try to symbolize the modeling. However, still yes. like to deliver this information. So, how uh, do you have any advice that how we actually handling this very boring teaching content? <laughs> For example, a uh, lot of mathematics, and they uh, actually uh, maybe many of the students they were not able to handle that uh, very complex uh, mathematics uh, to solve engineer problems. Yes. Uh, uh, there's a lot of terms is uh, they were only function at a, a specific conditions. I mean, they uh -huh. have a very narrow boundary conditions, for example. And uh, maybe you could give, I don't know whether you have this experience where I would teach engineering or just teaching like, uh, you know. Uh, uh, Any STEM science. Uh, yes. So um, I would say one of the things that I've learned from the faculty that are teaching in STEM is the importance of active learning within the course, which is easier said than done, but taking perhaps one particular topic um, and making sure that you chunk the topic so that perhaps there's lecture, perhaps there's some discussion, um, and then perhaps a little lecture and perhaps a reflection. Um, there's something called chunking. So they call it chunking. It doesn't sound very nice, but chunking. And so what you're doing is making sure that you break up the class so it's not just lecture or it's not just discussion, right? So that's one way. But making sure at the very beginning of the course that you do some formative feedback to find out what is working well at the very beginning and then help reinstate it throughout the semester. Um, how, just doing searches for how can I get that active learning experience within the classroom? Students start feeling that engagement the other piece that I'm sure you, you know is when you feel that connection with the faculty member, um, even though it's through the screen, you start uh, feeling like I wanna make sure that I'm there because I wanna help support that faculty member, right? Yeah. That's a piece of it as well. Yeah, yeah I, I, uh, so my course is, uh, is uh, for the master and the PhD yes. students. So the information was there. So yes. we have a limited time. We have to deliver this information. For example, I can tell you like, in one class within like a two or 45 minutes, I have to oh, goodness. explain explain 100 uh, different uh, equations. Oh my goodness. Uh, those are new equations, the students don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, maybe, they, maybe they were not able to understand at all. So, yeah. uh, so how you balance this kind of like, you have a amount of uh, like tons of like a new, uh, uh, like uh, engineering topics, questions that uh, you have to deliver within limited time. I know a, a number uh, of our engineering faculty have taken advantage of uh, a pedagogy called team-based learning, 
okay. where a lot of the information is on the front end. So students will engage with Khan Academy or a video that you've created. So that when you come into the classroom, that's when you're having the students work in teams to build and interact with the material so that you can help kind of give uh, suggestions or information for them to be successful. Um, there's no one perfect tool. That's the, that's the challenge that we have. I wish I could, I'll hand you a Wang Jing and there, everything is fixed. But what I can share is if you just take that one sticky point that happened um, and just work that piece, your, your course will just continue to improve. I'm not saying it's going to be perfect, but I'm going to say just- No, 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 your, your method suggestions are wonderful. I, 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 yes, I think wonderful. They, they, will, they will be useful, but, uh, but, uh, but this is the first year. I mean, I'm not sure like oh. what kind of content I should include, but it's just a lot of information you have to deliver. It is, so maybe it's next a lot. year will be better. I can uh, like, uh, now I know what I should do and uh, I, you know, what, uh, what is already the, the background knowledge they already have, but yeah, I mean, they, what they have not have, uh, actually, yeah. I was, every time when I start a new uh, class, uh, I yeah. ask students, uh, you know, I know I have all the line of, of my lecture today. So if those topics have been told in your previous class, then they have to answer me. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, actually, because, uh, yeah, because the people are, are changing that, uh, that uh, you know, um, some people, some topics were repeatedly taught, like for example, they, they, they taught the, in a the, in the, uh, bachelor level, but however, the, mm -hmm. the, you know, the theoretical background uh, understanding is very low. So they didn't mm -hmm. have any theory. Then uh, when I come to the, the master and, and the PhD level, they have to go to a very advanced level. Mm -hmm. So then they could, uh, you know, uh, quantitatively uh, perform this, uh, you know, some of dynamic analysis or chemical analysis Mm -hmm. Quantitatively, they can uh, use the data to explain every phenomena uh, was uh, reflect engineering, for mm -hmm. example, operations. Mm -hmm. But those was in bachelor level, they were only told the principles. So how it works, uh, well, no, when it works, but how it works and uh, to what extent, uh, to what level, how to you know quantitatively describe it is nothing. So yeah. Anyway, so it's really good. Uh, you have a very good uh, suggestion and your experience is really beneficial for, for us. Uh, Thank you. And I did put in chat um, and we could share it out to the main interface is that tilt in, tilt in higher ed, the transparency and learning and teaching. You might wanna just take a look at that. Um, mm. And thank you so much. And I appreciate <laughs> everything that you all do. You all have, been very successful at what you're doing and just persevering everything that we did this last year. I mean, you all, I mean, yeah, uh, awards we cannot, around. We, we cannot physically meet. That's a problem yeah. as well, right? <laughs> we cannot talk to face to face to our students. Yes, the only exactly. way we have to through this kind of Zoom right now is the same in Denmark. I mean, yes, definitely. Well, I'll hand it off to the panel because I, I know right. I went over. Well, this is a good timing. We This is a 45 uh, good uh, discussion so far. Uh, we will continue the discussion in the, in the, in the pan panel uh, uh, later on. Thank you. So, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bessler, for your nice presentation. You give us a lot of pract practical tools to think about, and this probably for, for virtual and also in-person learning, this is very uh, beneficial.